Okay, welcome. Uh, we're going to talk about monopoly now. This is the polar opposite of competition. As we'll see, um, competition has all those desirable aspects that we like. Um, it's relatively rare in the world to see a purely competitive market, but still many of those forces operate in abbreviated forms in other markets. Um, today we're going to talk about monopoly and show all the deleterious things that come about when monopolies are allowed to price as they would wish. Um, so we have kind of the polar opposite in terms of the structure of the market. It's a very different kind of market and in the outcome from it. It's also the case that it's relatively rare to see a true monopoly um, as we're describing here. Um, and uh, when they exist, we actually usually regulate them. Okay, so a monopoly has two conditions. There's only one firm and there's no entry. So there's only one firm and there's only going to ever be one firm. So it's not like uh, the firm that is existing there has to worry about new competitors entering the industry. Um, what can you think of now that is a monopoly that sets its prices as it wishes? What? Diamonds. Um, is that true? Is that a, it's a cartel, I understand. What you said, no. There's more than one firm product providing diamonds? I think, I think I've always heard there's De Beers providing diamonds. So that could be one. Um, also, pharmaceuticals, most patented drugs are a monopoly. Um, this is an extremely important case. This is actually a government granted monopoly. As soon as you develop a new drug, um, the company that developed it is given a patent which allows it to produce it and doesn't allow anyone else to produce it uh, without that firm's permission. And so the firm has a monopoly power over it. We're going to see what the impact of that is and then later in this course talk about why we won't not, even though it creates a monopoly and has the problems we're going to discuss today, we might still want to do it for pharmaceuticals. There are other firms that are monopolies, like PG&E. There's only one company that provides our gas and electricity, but that one we don't allow to price as it wants. Um, we regulate it. The P California Public Utilities Commission regulates it. And um, the reason it's regulated is because we don't want it to act in the way we're going to describe in today's lecture of how it would act if it were not regulated, if it were allowed to set prices on its own. And in future lectures, we're going to talk about how to regulate these monopolies effectively. Okay, so talk about monopoly. We want to talk about the, and the revenue side, where it gets its revenue and uh, how it makes decisions about that, and then the cost side, combine the two, find out what the firm produce, uh, chooses to produce as output and what the outcome of all that is. Revenues. The most important thing to recognize about monopoly is that the monopolist faces the market demand curve. Since there's only one firm, the demand for the firm is the same as the demand for the market. So this is the key way in which it's different from a competitive firm. A competitive firm, there's a market demand, say, for wheat, and then there's an individual firm's demand for its own product, its own wheat. Um, and so you have two different demand curves. Here, there's just one demand curve. It's for the market, and the firm um, um, faces that. Also, there is no given price. There's no concept of price given to the market because there is no market. There's just this one firm. Um, so what that means is that the firm has to set its price. And those two ideas relate to each other. In particular, if the firm set its price at any particular level, there's some maximum amount that it can sell at that price. And that's whatever is read off of the demand curve. That's how much people would buy at that price. At any given price, the demand curve tells it how much it would be able to sell. Um, if the firm then, after it's selling Q1 levels of output, wants to think about increasing its output, sell more, to be able to sell more output, it's kind of going through a thought process. Do I want to sell Q1 or I want to sell more than that or what? Um, it realizes that to be able to sell more than Q1 output, it can't charge that same price because no one's going to buy it. There's not a demand in excess of this quantity. So to be able to sell extra units, the firm has to lower its price. Um, the firm is, by lowering its price, moves down 
um, moves along the market demand curve to a higher level of output. This is a interesting thing. We think of monopolists as being more powerful than, than competitive firms, and they are because they get to set their price, whereas competitive firms um, um, get uh, take prices given. They can't do anything about the market price. But there's a slight paradox in the whole thing. A competitive firm can sell as much as it wants to at the going price. If it just wants to increase its output, it just increases its output and sells it. Its own decision. But a monopolist can't. So in a sense, a monopolist is constrained in a way that a competitive firm can't, isn't. A monopolist, if it wants to sell additional output, it has to lower its price to get someone to buy that output because it's already selling as much as it can at the, uh, the existing, at the higher price. If it weren't selling all of it, could, it could, it just increases output by meeting market demand. What this means is that the process for the firm to decide on how much to produce is a little more complicated for the monopolist. It has to make a comparison of how much benefit it gets from extreme, ex expanding its output compared to the cost of doing so. And to do this, we um, use a concept called marginal revenue. It's the same as every other marginal idea. It's what is the impact of one extra unit on the revenue of the firm. So it's how much extra revenue does the firm get for selling one extra unit. For a competitive firm, if it sells one extra unit, it gets whatever the market price is. So there, there's no, no reason to distinguish this concept there. It's very clear. But with a monopolist, the firm can't sell an additional output unit of output at the existing price. It has to lower its price. Um, and the amount that it has to lower it is um, uh, something we want to look at. So the first thing to recognize is that we have a demand curve. And then what I'm going to draw here and hope to convince you is that the marginal revenue curve is below the demand curve and touches the demand curve at this axis. Okay. So it is below it and it splays out as you go further down. It gets further and further below it the little farther out you go. You've got two demand curve, uh, two curves now. The demand curve, which is the maximum amount you can um, sell at a given price or looked at in reverse at a given output that you want to sell, what is the maximum price you can sell it at? Um, and then the marginal revenue, which is the extra revenue that the firm gets from selling one extra unit of output. For the monopolist, the marginal revenue is less than the price because the firm has to lower its price to be able to sell extra output. For a competitive firm, if you wanted to define marginal revenue, it would be price. So it would be marginal revenue is equal to price for a, mar for a competitive firm because it can sell one extra unit at the existing price. A monopolist can't. But it's not just that marginal revenue is below price. Marginal revenue below price is why the marginal revenue curve is below the demand curve. For any given quantity, the price that you could charge and sell that unit, th that many units, is higher than the marginal revenue you can get from selling additional units. That's all that this relation is saying, is that marginal revenue is lower than price for any given quantity that's being sold currently. But there's a second aspect of this that um, I, I, uh, is, is important to understand and in drawing the graphs. In particular, they have the same intercept and this one gets further and further below as the um, quantity sold increases. As quantity increases, the difference between price and marginal revenue becomes bigger. Now, why is this? The reason is, you can go back to the previous graph. If the firm is thinking about selling Q1 and the maximum price it can charge is that amount, and then it's saying, okay, well, now let me think about another amount that's higher, Q2, and to sell that, I have to lower my price to P2. Two things are going on in the calculus that the firm is making of whether to move from Q1 to Q2. One, they are indeed selling more units, okay, and they're getting whatever price they, they're charging, P2, for those new units. So this right here is an extra revenue for them. If this is one unit of increase from Q1 to Q2 is just one unit, this is the extra revenue from that one extra unit sold. But that's not the only thing that happens. The reduction in price means that they're obtaining less money from all the people that they could have charged more to 
if they were willing to sell fewer units in total. If they were selling only Q1, if the firm had decided I'm just gonna sell Q1, it could sell at a higher price. And so to sell these extra units, it has to lower its price and it lowers it to all of its customers. It offers just one price. And so these customers that would have been willing to pay a higher price are now paying a lower price. So the firm essentially loses this amount of money right here from all the people that were previously were, or, or would have been willing to buy at the higher price. So two things go on when the firm is deciding whether to increase its output. First of all, it gets extra revenue by selling extra units, but it loses revenue on all the units it could have sold at the lower quantity, at the higher price. That is why this graph, uh, the next one I'm gonna show is, uh, uh, that I already did show, this one, um, is below marginal revenue at an increasing amount. Here, you're not selling anything already, and so reducing your price on the goods you're already selling doesn't hurt you any. As you increase output, you're selling more and more units, and so you're, by lowering your price, you're losing more money on those units that you could have sold at the higher price. Going back to the previous graph, this quantity right here, if Q is all the way over here, it's just gonna be a small amount, and as you get Q to be bigger and bigger, this rectangle just stretches out further and further. So the loss on the units that you could have sold at the higher price becomes greater the more you're selling. You're always talking about, given what you're selling, how much revenue do I get from selling one extra unit? And the more you're already selling means the more you're gonna lose by, by lowering your price. Yeah. Hmm? On the shape of the demand curve, going the wrong way here. Um, as I've drawn it here, if this is Q1 and this is one extra unit, then the marginal revenue from one extra unit is this box, which is the extra money you get from selling that one extra unit, minus this box, which is the loss. And as I've drawn it, that's a positive amount because this is bigger than that, just you can look at it visually. But you're correct, it need not be. It's possible that this quantity here is smaller than this. And in fact, on any demand curve, there will be areas where increasing output actually reduces your revenue. You lose more on the units you could have sold at the higher price than you make on the extra units that you sell at the new price. That's a very important point. As I've drawn it though, the marginal revenue is positive because this extra revenue exceeds this loss on the units that you could have sold at the higher price. And that's what we have here. Marginal revenue of one extra unit is positive, but it's less than the price that you're making on that one extra unit because you're having to lower your price on all the previous units that you could have sold at the higher price. And your point, continuing it, if marginal revenue, if I just extended this curve, marginal revenue eventually becomes zero and eventually becomes negative. And that's where the extra revenue from one unit is less than the amount you're losing on all the units you could have sold at the higher price. So that's exactly what you were saying there. Um, of course, we don't need to consider negative marginal revenues because a firm will never move into that area. That is why this distance, this distance captures the loss from the units that you could have sold at the higher price. And as you're selling more and more units, that loss becomes greater because you're reducing the price for more and more units. So that loss is very small if you're not selling many to start with, and it gets bigger and bigger as you go along. That's why they um, um, splay out. Okay, now the costs of the firm. Costs of the firm we've already been over. Um, we have marginal cost, average cost, just as we would expect. 
Uh, we don't need to say anything about them at this stage. We're going to talk about it a little later about what they are. All we know is that the marginal cost curve has to go through the minimum of the average cost. That's just by definition. So um, the curves have that relationship to them, so e each other. Let's put them all together. Now, if you're a kind of person who says, oh, let's look for uh, intersections, you, you'd be kind of hard pressed to figure out which intersection is relevant because you've got four of them here. Um, the question now is, what will the firm choose as its output level and its price? The easy way to do this is just to walk through the decision process of the firm. The firm starts out with very little output and asks itself, should I produce one extra unit? The cost of doing so is read off the marginal cost curve. The revenue from doing so is read off the marginal revenue curve. And since marginal revenue exceeds marginal cost, then the firm will produce one extra unit because they get more revenue than it costs them to produce it. So this, the difference between the two is the, in a sense, marginal profit, the profit for that one extra unit. And then the firm will increase its output and ask the question again. Again, marginal revenue is greater than marginal cost. And this will continue until marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. At that point, the firm will stop. It doesn't want to go further because marginal cost then exceeds marginal revenue, and the cost of producing one extra unit exceeds what it gets in extra revenue. So it would lose money by increasing its output any further. So it stops at this intersection. Now, so that is a easy process where we're marching the firm through levels of output. It's not the intuitive way you think about how firms uh, make their choices. You would think, well, a firm sets its price. But this is an equivalent way that is, um, uh, ties it in more easily with a competitive market. The firm starts out with very low level of output and increases output until the extra revenue that it gets from an extra unit is equal to extra cost. So it stops there. That tells us what the output level is. And as soon as we know the output level, we know what, firm, what price the firm is going to charge. It's going to charge the highest price possible that can sell that level of output. Any price below this amount, and that's read off the demand curve. What's, what can it, what's the price at which it can sell this level of output? Any lower price is unnecessary because it could sell this amount of demand plus extra. It could charge a lower price and only sell this amount, but it doesn't, there's no reason to. Why should it lower its price if it doesn't have to? And it can't sell a, a tr price higher because if it tried to price higher, it couldn't sell all this output. And it already knows that this is the level of output that maximizes its profit. So it wants to be able to sell all that output. That means that has to be the price. And you then calculate profits as the difference between the price and the average cost at the level of output that the firm is producing. The firm is producing at that price, and this is the average cost at that quantity of output. So that's the profit per unit, number of units. That box right there is the profits that the firm makes. Um, I want to... Okay, who was it again that asked about the uh, shape of the demand curves and the, uh, it was you, okay. We can return to that because it's actually an important issue that I didn't draw on the graphs. Suppose you were to extend the marginal revenue curve to where it became negative. So you just extended this down here. There is an area in which, like we showed earlier, if you increase your output, the extra revenue you get from the extra output is less than the amount you lose by reducing price on all your previous units. You're selling so much that reducing your price on the previous units really hurts you a lot, and it's negative. But why is it that we can ignore that? We never have to draw it. You would never have an intersection of marginal revenue with marginal cost where marginal revenue is negative. Because marginal cost can't be negative. It can be zero. What's a good with a zero marginal cost? Think of one. What? Software, internet books, 
All those things are, fr you know, after, you, after they've been created, it's essentially free to give it to an extra person. Um, but you can't have negative marginal cost. And so we don't really need to extend this and consider that region. What that tells us is that the firm, it's another way of saying the firm will never be in the area of the demand curve where marginal revenue is negative, where increasing output actually reduces its revenue. Yeah. Ah, subsidies, yes. And in fact, that, that's a good example. Um, if you want the firm to produce more, the firm will, could, no matter what the marginal cost of the firm is, it will never choose to go beyond where its marginal revenue is zero. I mean, it would only go there if its marginal cost is zero. But if you as the government, or we as society, want the firm to produce more, then we would need to subsidize it, and that would induce it to move out to this marginal. Essentially, the, it, its own marginal revenue would then not be negative because it would get the subsidy plus its own revenue. That's a good point. So what we have in equilibrium is that profits are positive, price is greater than average cost, and price is greater than marginal cost. Notice that price is necessarily greater than marginal cost because price, um, because marginal cost is equal to marginal revenue, and marginal revenue is less than price because the firm has to drop its price to sell more units. What we have then is a series of undesirable outcomes which are just about the flip of what happens in competition. We have prices greater than marginal cost. Um, it's because the firm sets its marginal revenue equal to marginal cost, chooses output level at which marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost, and yet marginal revenue is less than price because it has to lower its price to sell an extra unit. So that means that price ends up being greater than marginal cost. What that tells us is that we're not at a social optimum. We're not at the desirable level of output from a social perspective. From a social perspective, we should produce more of this good. Um, people's willingness to pay on the margin is equal to price, and yet the cost of producing an extra unit is less than that. So from a social perspective, we should be producing more of this good. Essentially, what a monopolist does is produce too little of a good and it does so because it wants to have a higher price, and the only way it can get the higher price is to sell less of the, of the good. The firm still has a trade-off. It can't have its cake and eat it too. If it wants a higher price, it has to sell less of the good. But it's willing to give up some units of output to be able to get that higher price and maximize its profits. And that's what is harmful from a social perspective. Um, second, the profits are positive. And insofar as you like the idea that consumers don't transfer income more than is absolutely necessary to keep the firm in business um, to the firm, then you would think this is not desirable. Um, price is greater than average cost, which is just another way of writing profit equals uh, is greater than zero. What this means is each person is paying more than their cost, their fair share of the cost of production. And Price is great, um, greater than the minimum of the average cost, which means that we're not producing at the lowest possible cost of producing this good. Finally, there is no mechanism to eliminate waste. This is a little bit more subtle, and it's uh, a little sh less strong than uh, you might think. Um, the firm has an incentive to reduce waste, that is, if the firm is wasting in its production processes, it would make more profit by eliminating that waste and keeping the profit. So it would have a reason for doing so. But unlike a competitive system, there's nothing that will force it to do so. If the firm is making less profit because it's wasting, it could just continue doing that. In a competitive industry, if any firm is currently wasting, and making zero profit or whatever, uh, other firms would enter, see that as a profit opportunity, drop the price, and the firms that had been wasting would have to quit wasting or go out of business. There's no such force operating here. There's no possibility of entry that would eliminate the waste. So the firm would choose to waste and choose not to waste, but if it happened to waste, there's nothing to prevent it. Yeah.
Um. The only way it would occur would be by an incredible coincidence. Did you ask the question? Yeah. Um, it's hard keeping everyone, which good. Okay. The only way this would occur is if marginal revenue happened to intersect marginal cost right here. Um, so it's possible, but it's, it's exceedingly unlikely. Um, I mean, you could, if all you'd have to do to get this curve to give that to you is shift the demand curves and marginal revenue curve up until this marginal revenue curve intersected marginal cost at that point there. At that point, the firm would be producing here, it would read price off of its demand curve, it shifted up demand curve, and would be producing where, um, at the minimum of the average cost curve. The um, price would still be higher than that, and so each person would be paying more than the minimum of average cost, so they'd be paying more than is necessary, but you'd still be producing at the minimum of the average cost. It's exceedingly unlikely, and I think you could, you know, from a general perspective, you can just say there's, you know, it's not going to happen. But that, it's a good distinction for you to make. Now, let's return to the first condition, which is the one that is most problematic from, uh, to economists, that we're not at the socially optimal output, price is greater than marginal cost. And I want to look at what that cost is and why we incur it in a monopoly situation. That's what the next few graphs are going to do. Um, this is the output level that the firm is going to choose on its own, right here. And this is the socially optimal output. How do we know that's socially optimal? Because this is the marginal willingness to pay curve. This is the marginal cost of producing the good. From a social perspective, you should always produce more of the good when marginal willingness to pay is greater than marginal cost, and you should quit when they're equal to each other. That's our basic concept of optimality. Always produce when people are willing to give up other goods to get more of this one. Their marginal willingness to pay is, higher, uh, is high enough to justify the cost of producing, the marginal cost. And then not go any further. We don't want to go where people's willingness to pay is less than the cost of the good. So we stop here. That's what's socially optimal. This is where the firm produces instead. So what the firm is doing is essentially raising, is raising price above what's socially optimal because it makes profit off a higher price. Notice that it does not raise price indefinitely, though. This is something that a lot of people have a hard time with. Firms, monopolists even, have a constraint on their pricing. They can't just raise price indefinitely and make more and more money. What happens here is if the firm tried to raise price above this, they would have to cut their output. They couldn't sell as much. And the loss from selling less output exceeds the gain from having a higher price. Essentially, they'd be giving up units at which the marginal cost of producing them exceed, is less than the marginal revenue from them. And so they'd be losing profit by doing so. So the firm raises its price to a certain level, but then chooses not to raise it any further. It can't just keep raising price and make more profit. Yeah. If demand is inelastic, I love it. How many of y'all have done this in section? This is a section topic. You're not supposed to do it until after this lecture. Why don't you tell us? If, the, if demand is inelastic, what does that mean? That means that if you increase your output, I'm, I'm sorry, if you increase your price by 1%, inelastic demand means your output is going to decrease by less than a half percent. So what that means, if the firm is facing inelastic demand, the firm is always going to want to increase its price because it gains more from increasing its price than it loses in, in output. That means 
that the firm will never choose to produce where it's in elastic demand. It will always keep raising price. Eventually, demand becomes elastic. Eventually, uh, price is so high that a 1% increase in price is a big amount. Um, so it will always eventually move up to that area. Interesting thing for you to work out at home, this point where marginal revenue is zero, that's where elasticity is equal to one, and where it's below zero is where elasticity is equal to less than one. This is the inelastic part of demand. And as you can see, a monopolist will never be in the inelastic portion of demand. It will always choose to raise its price at least that amount. Okay, but where was I going? Okay, so the firm is going to raise price above what's socially optimal, decreasing output. And there is a loss to society because of that. This deadweight loss is the loss to society from having the firm price above marginal cost. These are the units that the willingness to pay exceeds the cost, and we're not producing those units. We're, with the monopolist, we're producing these units. If we could increase production, consumers would get this amount of extra benefit, their willingness to pay, and it would only cost us this amount. And so we're losing those potential benefits. Another way to look at it is as we go from the socially optimal output to the output that is the monopolist choice, we are losing the benefits of the consumption the reduced consumption. The way the firm raises its price, again, if it raises its price, it has to reduce output. It, it, even a monopolist doesn't get a free lunch. And so if it wants to raise price, which it does, output has to reduce. And society loses from that lost output because that output provides benefits to people that are in excess of the cost of that output. Um, now, we're going to use these kinds of graphs over and over again in this class, and you're going to be using them probably the rest of your life to think about situations like this. So I want to go through uh, in detail how each party to this transaction in this market is affected. So I want to consider the impact on consumers and the firm of moving from the monopolist price to the socially optimal price and see what all the impacts are. If we could increase output from what the monopolist uh, is producing to a lower price with a higher level of output, if we could, then consumers would benefit by this area right here. This is the change in consumer surplus. You've seen this before in reverse. If you have an increase in price, this is the loss to consumers. Or if you're considering a decrease in price, it's the gain to consumers. This consists of two things. First, consumers, I'm gonna try to use the little cursor here, see how this works. Okay, so I don't keep moving back and forth. This square right here uh. <laughs> is the amount that consumers um, would gain from a lower price for whatever they're currently consuming. So you start at P star and lower the price to P zero Whatever they're currently consuming, they're now getting at a lower price. And so the benefits are this blue area, light blue area, which is the, the lower price on each of the units they're currently consuming. This triangle area is, let me go back to this. This triangle area is, not only will they get, have to pay a lower price for their existing units, they also buy more units because now the price is lower, and these units, the marginal willingness to pay was lower than the original price, but now it's higher than the new price. So they get benefits from these extra units that they consume, which are this amount. So they get a dollar benefit from the units they were already consuming and a benefit from the new units that they're now consuming. The firm has two um, effects also. There's two effects on the firm. First of all, if the price drops, then they're gonna lose this amount of money on the goods that they were selling at the higher price. Because essentially it's those, those people that were buying Q-star amount 
they're just now getting it at a lower price, and so the firm loses that amount of money. Notice that this loss is exactly the same as the gain to the consumers. So that's a wash. The gain to the consumer, it's a loss to the firm. And, okay, so the firm loses this. But the firm also gains by producing more output. If the firm produced more output, it would be selling that output, even at the new price, at a price that's greater than this marginal cost, and so it would gain this amount here. Why does the firm not increase output from here to here and lower its price? Because the gain is less than the loss, just as I've shown it. So when you break out all these units, you can easily see why the firm doesn't choose to move there. We as a society would like the firm to move there, but the firm doesn't want to. And the firm's making the cho choices here. So the firm chooses not to because it would lose more than it would gain. But what's interesting is when you then put the two parts together, the loss to the firm Ah, there. The loss to the firm is a gain to consumers. So from a social perspective, that's a wash. From the firm's perspective, it's a loss. And it counts it and makes decisions on the basis of it. But from a social perspective, we don't consider it a loss because it's made up as a gain to the consumers. So this is just a wash. And all that happens is these extra units of output that um, that we are now producing at the social optimal output give consumers an extra gain and the firm an extra gain. So essentially there, from a social perspective, there is no loss. There's a wash on this part and then a foregone gain. And that is why it's bad to have monopoly because we end up losing these benefits that we potentially could have had if somehow the firm could be induced to price at marginal cost instead of pricing above marginal cost. Okay, da-da. So all of this is just repeating what I've said. Now, given all this, why do we have monopolies? In some situations, it's actually cheaper to have demand met with one firm than with numerous firms. And in those situations, you simply, it would not make sense to have competition. We want to have a monopolist from a social, from a cost perspective, but we don't want it to price like a monopolist. That's called a natural monopoly. When the price of producing the good of meeting demand is lower with one firm with, than with multiple firms, then it's called a natural monopoly. Um, another definition that is relevant here is increasing returns to scale. Increasing returns to scale is, a, is an aspect of technology that either exists or ex does it for a particular production process. It's when a given percent increase in all inputs bring about more than a percent increase in the output. So if you double all your inputs, suppose there's some synergy in production, which means that you can produce more than twice as much output. So you double your inputs, you get more than twice as much output. What does this necessarily imply about the average cost curve? Average cost necessarily, if there's increasing returns to scale in the production process, average cost is necessarily decreasing because average cost is the um, total cost divided by quantity. If we double our inputs, our um, total cost doubles, but our output more than doubles, that means this goes up by more than two. So the ratio goes down. The top number goes doubles, the bottom number more than doubles, so their ratio decreases. What that tells us is when there's increasing returns to scale in the production process, it's just something that's given by technology, it's not something the firm controls or even you know, the government can control, it's just how production operates in this industry, um, then, then average costs are going to fall. 
And if we have average cost curve dropping at all levels of demand output up to the demand curve, it makes no sense to have competitive firms. What we want, what we would like, is to have one firm producing here, which is the lowest possible cost of meeting demand. Why should we have 10 firms, each of them producing a tenth of that, somewhere way up here, at a very high price, at a very high cost? That's simply a waste to society. So when we have this kind of demand, um, average cost curve, the average cost curve is downward sloping, getting lower and lower um, for all levels of output beyond, um, before you get to the market demand. We want there to be a monopoly from a cost perspective, but we don't want it to price like a monopolist. Um, that is what a natural monopoly is. Um, and in those situations, any attempt to bring about competition will necessarily fail. And um, so we just need to resign ourselves to the fact that there should be one firm, but we can't let it price like a monopolist. If we tried to take this firm that was producing somewhere out here and break it up, what would happen is you'd have a lot of firms that are producing extremely high cost. If any of them happened to gain market share, kind of get an advantage over their competitors, it would sell X more, its average cost would go down, it could undercut its competitors, that would get it even more of the market, it could continue on, and it would just, one of those firms would eventually move out and take over the market. So even if we tried to bring about competition here, it would fail. In a situation with natural monopoly, we have the basic dilemma that we cannot have the advantages of competition, and yet we don't want to have a monopolist that's unregulated. So what the, cons um, the policy conclusions are is when you have a natural monopoly, when from a cost perspective we want there to be only one firm, then we allow the monopolist, but we regulate it. That's what we do with PG&E. Um, we recognize that we want to have one firm producing uh, gas and electricity in, in, in the area, and then we regulate it to keep its price as close to, to marginal cost as possible. And then when there's not a natural monopoly, then we try to prevent the growth of monopoly power when there's not a natural monopoly is when it's actually cheaper to have lots of firms than just um, one. And we want to prevent the growth of a monopoly in those situations to prevent the deleterious aspects of monopoly pricing. Okay? Everyone happy? Great. We will talk about monopolistic competition next week, next uh, Wednesday. Thank you.